Our next guest is a pioneer, if I may say so. Um, and with her, we get our second panel started, the augmented human. And I'm so delighted to have her with us as an utmost expert in transhumanism. Natasha Vitamore is an expert in how technology is impacting cultural and social, po uh, and social political models and why we all need to be well informed about these impacts. She's one of the three pioneers of the transhumanist movement and authored the Transhuman Manifesto in 1983. She achieved a scientific breakthrough on long-term memory of C. elegans, introduced the seminal field of human enhancement for longevity and academics, and received international recognition for designing the first whole body prosthetics. She is a professor of humanities and ethics and entrepreneurship, and serves as the executive director of Humanity Plus. She's published in numerous academic articles and books and featured in over two dozen televised documentaries on humanity's future. Dear Natasha, thank you so much that you accepted our invitation and that you now enlighten us a bit more about the realms of feasibility of a future human. Thank you. Were I a bit more intelligent, I'd be able to say thank you with all gratitude and humility in German, but I simply cannot, and I apologize. But truly thank you for such a lovely introduction. And it's really quite remarkable to be here. I, I took um, a little traveling with the usual traveling nonsense that occurs. Um, but I'm here, and I'm awake, and I can't believe it. So, good. OK, um, so the body emergent, humankind together. I put humankind, not only because it's a, a play on du ex machina, but we are humans. That's who we are. That's part of our species. We are distinct animals, and we're part of the Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, evolution, and bottom line is, if you define what a human is, in most dictionaries, it says a mortal animal. So those are two things, an animal and mortal. We're defined by our mortality, meaning we are designed by whomever, whatever your belief system is, that's perfectly fine, but we evolved, were designed, manufactured, engineered as humans from a conglomeration, a bacterium. And Dr. Lynn Margulies, who is a biologist, an evolutionary biologist, and wrote the book, What is Life? Truly influenced my doctorate. And I hold a PhD in life expansion, taking a look at what we evolved from and what we could or might evolve into. As humans, we are not the final end of our evolution. And to think so would be certainly without humility, and certainly not thinking about the ecology, the ecosystem that we live within, which is comprised of numerous types of life forms. And the life forms keep on changing. Some of them die off. Some of it's very sad that they die off due to industrialization and other issues humankind has brought about. Some of them are born based on some of the circumstances humankind has brought about. Think of synthetic biology. That might be a beneficial field, it could be a dangerous field that is up to us to determine and create the practices, the ethics, and the rules and guidelines, the legislation, so we can better adjust and adhere to what works, not just only on an individual scale or a local scale, but also across nations, not my country versus your country. We live on a planet as a family together, as a species, and we forget that so often. 
Um, excuse me, many of us forget that so often. You probably are the few that don't forget that. So I apologize for saying that. But many people forget that we live on this planet as a species. We're family. And yes, we're different. And that's the beauty of it, that we're so diverse that I may agree with you maybe about gender, but I may have a difference of opinion politically. I may agree with you religiously or spiritually, but I could have a different opinion about something else, the advances or life extension, etc. So regardless of our differences, we must be ever more thoughtful and mindful of the fact that we are different, we are diverse, and to celebrate that and let all this other political crap go. I've had, had enough of it, and I'm sure you have too. I've um, unfriended many people for their constant political <laughs> outbursts. I don't want to hear it. I'm on Facebook. Come meet me in class, or let's have a conference or a discussion, and let's debate it and talk about it. But not on Facebook. OK, so yes. Exponential technologies here, uh, my dear friend Ray Kurzweil has told us this over and over again. Exponential, exponential, exponential. What does that mean? It means outward. It also means the curve. The curve, according to exponential technology, refers to a point in time when artificial intelligence, robotics, machines become far more intelligent than humans, not just through cognitive data processing and functionality of cognition, but also with wisdom. So it's both sapience and sentience, and that's what we're looking at. If that does occur, it's theoretical supposition. We do not know if it will or not. Chances are it probably will. So we need to be aware of this, take our heads out of the sand, and go, OK, this could happen. How are we going to deal with it? OK, body 2020. So I was invited to speak on the body emergent, and I'm going to approach it through um, some perspectives I really want to bring home here. We can hashtag the heck out of this. We can give it so many different types of hashtags, but the bottom line is the body emergent means, as I said, we're continuing to evolve. It's up to us as a species and an informed society to determine how far is too far, how less is too less, should we tell people they can't live longer because we don't think it's right? Or pe should people be able to live longer because they desire to? Now, when I'm talking about living longer, I don't mean living longer in a wheelchair and drooling. And I'm not talking about with dementia. If any of you have taken care of your parents or grandparents or maybe yourselves with dementia or Alzheimer's, it's pretty daunting. I took care of my mother for the last few years of her life. It's pretty daunting. And you want to love and you want to give. You want to be there 100% because it's your parent. But boy, when you're yelled at and criticized for every little thing, you kind of oh, have to take a break and go, dementia is not who that person is. The brain has changed. Our brains are constantly changing. We were once told that at a certain age, our neurons are gone. We don't regenerate them. However, then we were told that we continue to regenerate neurons in our brains to perpetuity as we age in our 70s, 80s, 90s. The jury's still out. We don't know. However, what we do know is we can build neurons. We can go in and tweak the dendrites, synapses, the electrical charges in the brain to help people with memory loss. And this is quite a wonderful thing. So any purist that's a humanish that says biotechnology or bioengineering is playing God. That's not the point. The point is to play God. I don't even know what God is. It seems to change every country I go to, every person I meet based on their particular religious or spiritual views. So let's just put that aside and say, let's be diverse. Your beliefs are your beliefs. Your moral beliefs, that's your morality. But when ethics gets involved, we need to take it out of the sector of morals because morals are emotional. They're us versus them. Ethics are the guidelines, the rules, the regulations, the laws, the social contracts that we have to be a society that moves forward, takes our head out of the sand, and takes a look at what's going on. We're continuing to evolve. So how are we evolving? Right now, uh -uh, there's a pretty nasty virus out there. 
which is freaking a lot of people out. And there's becoming an hysteria. We need to be careful about that. In some instances, we need to get the most accurate information to know what to be concerned or afraid about and to be darn tootin' afraid about it and get in there and try to solve the problem rather than hide from it or don't travel because of it. I'm here. People told me to stay home. Why are you going? Why are you getting on a plane? I took plenty of hand wipes and things and I'm protecting myself. But it's not going to stop me and it's not going to cause me to sell off my stock because we know that doesn't work. So, no cap. This is no nonsense. I'm going to give you some facts. You may agree with me, you may disagree with me, and that's fine. Okay, human, a mortal animal. We have a shelf life. We have a maximum of 123.5 master menos years to live. That's it. So the first years of our life are joyous, fun, goes in a little hard time as teenagers. Well, terrible too is pretty bad, but we think they're great. Our parents think they're bad. Teenagers, oh, it's a struggle for most of us. Uh, early 20s, 30s, we start to learn how to get a job, invest, prepare for our future, and all of a sudden, 50. In the United States, we get a letter from the AARP. I don't know if you have that in Germany, but that means you're a senior citizen. So at 55, we get a second letter from the AARP. Oh, sign up, join our programs, be with the silver sneakers at the gym. I am not going to be with the silver sneakers at the gym. I love lifting weights, I love downhill skiing, so that's not for me. Not that I have anything wrong with it, it's just not for me. Okay, so if we have a shelf life, that means our species has never lived longer than 122.3 or 123.5. And Jean Clement, a French woman, is said to be the longest living person. Who knows? Because sometimes facts are not always out in the public eye. But in the Bible, it says people live for hundreds of years, right? Hundreds and hundreds of years. So who knows? But in this day and age, we know that our, our, our biology starts degenerating, and we will get arthritis, and we will get certain diseases, and our brains will start functioning at less capacity. I've already noticed it in myself. Others have noticed it too about me and told me. <laughs> okay, so evolution is a continuous process. There's no end point we don't know. So the question is, if we have the opportunity now to help steer our evolution that's pretty cool. That ties into the introduction about cybernetics. Cybernetics, what a great concept. Norbert Weiner, one of my heroes of all time, Norbert Weiner, cybernetics, thinking about feedback and control. Okay, then Manfred Klein's and Nathan Klein coined the term cyborg, which was borrowed by Donna Haraway in the postmodernists, and science fiction, films, and whatnot. But a cyborg is basically a human machine. We're not talking about sapience or sentience. We're not talking about cognitive intellectualism or emotion and wisdom and awareness and learning in that way. We're talking about cyborg machine. Nothing wrong with it, it's great. We've seen many cyborgs with prosthetics, but now we're seeing humans with artificial limbs that are not cyborg. They actually are really smart and they're interconnected to the human brain through haptic systems. And these haptic systems can work through the cells of your skin or the wires going to your brain or through batteries to take your thinking and put it into feeling the coolness of water or the warmth of coffee. Isn't that cool? So someone with a prosthetic arm can feel a handshake. That is lovely. The blind can see. People with othernesses are no longer the others. They're integrated so fully into society because we no longer think of them as the other. And thanks, of course, to Foucault for bringing that to our attention. But it's built further past that. And it's quite wonderful that today we don't blink. Look at that person. When we see someone who looks differently, it's become custom. The same with gender identification. We don't know what gender you are. It doesn't matter. It's who you are that matters. OK. Bottom line, the future is unknown. If you have any futurist, and yes, I, I am also a futurist, and I strategize for companies and industries and universities and governments, I'll be a fool if I say I know the future because I do not know. And anyone who says he or she does know the future, they are absolutely wrong. So don't trust anyone who says they do. However, if they make predictions 
not be careful. If they make forecasts, pay attention, because forecasts are looking at possible scenarios for futures, not one future, but multiple opportunities and choices for futures. Okay, so if you believe in evolution, then you know that we came from a conglomeration of bacterium, as Dr. Lynn Margulis writes in What is Life, and then you learn that we grew as a species, there's the Australopithecus, the early hominins, the um, evolution step by step, and then we know that our frontal lobes started growing faster. Was that because of meat or we had to problem solve or was it because of linguistics or symbols? It's still not sure. But the point is we have evolved to where we do have a brain, but the brain is also shrinking. It's growing smaller, but we're growing taller. I didn't get that gene, but it's happening. So when we look at where we are, from the Homo sapiens, the brain developments, the rituals, the language, the problem solving, all those wonderful strategic skills that we developed. Then we get into where are we now? Okay, the cyborg took a little bit of attention over here, but let's bring it back to the human. Let's bring it back to what our needs are as humans, what our sense of ethics are, and what we need as um, a society. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the transhuman perspective and why I think that is so important. But if you go back here at evolution, this was done through what? How were these skulls checked? Does anyone know? Taking a look at the DNA, right? Taking a look at the bone scans and figuring out what is the comp composition of that, the bone that was left. Then we make assumptions on what era in the development. So, the biological human has an expiration date. We have genetics. We inherit most of our genes, although sometimes we develop and we're influenced by the society around us and culturization, et cetera. Um, but we're given a kind of Russian roulette, a lottery of genes, and that's what we have to deal with. Now, if you haven't had your DNA sequence, I suggest you do it. It's only $99 at 23andMe. I had that done in, I guess, 10, 15 years ago or something, and you know, it was scary to look at, but it, it was okay. But if you wanna know what your genes are that have been passed on over the, the eons, have your DNA sequenced. You don't have to have the whole sequence, which would be about $10,000 plus, but for $99, $100, at least take a look to see, and don't be shy. If you have a propensity for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, cancer or prostate cancer, it's better to know so you can start working at preventing it. If you have a propensity for ALS, Alzheimer's, MS, et cetera, then at least start preparing. Be aware of what you're carrying around in you because it is evolving. It's changing. The digital human, okay, that's another part of us. We spend most of our time online. In fact, the attention span of most people is just a few seconds. Uh, the retention span of most people is I don't even want to go there because that's kind of scary because you'll forget how I said it. But the bottom line is we spend most of our time in our digital environments, whether it's online and social media, um, communicating via Skype, email, texting, et cetera. That is part of us. And those zeros and ones have taken ourselves, our identity, our persona outside our body. So we're not just a single agency. We're a dual agency. We have all these othernesses outside of us. But let me make something very clear for anyone who's a fundamental um, human. The human biology has never been ever 100% human. The human evolved with another life form called mitochondria. We cannot exist without this other life form in our bodies. It's not in every single cell of our body, it's certainly in our gut, but it's in most cells of our bodies and we cannot exist without it because mitochondria develops our ATP, it's our energy source. So I think that's really important to think about when we're thinking about human evolution and becoming a transhuman or what it is we're going to become and how long we're going to live and how to think about the socio-political economic structures that we exist within, that we've never been exclusively 100% human, we've also evolved and coexisted with another life form. Okay, so we um, substrate limited, meaning in biology or in digitality, uh, virtual, computational, and then there's the machine human that, um, what this conference is about, homo ex machina, how is the machine and the human 
merging, what does that mean? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? What are we going to do about it? Do we own our own humanity and say, no, I'm going to stay 100% biological. This is who I am. But you're not 100% human. You've always had mitochondria. Nor have you been 100% biological. Because if you think when the frontal lobe started developing way back when, it developed because of language, symbols, and tools. Whether fire was created by an early hominid or lightning struck a tree, I don't know. I wasn't there. But what I do know is that our brain helped us build tools. And to build our brain out, we had to evolve. So if we live across platforms, so then the furthest out digital human would be what? An upload. And you've heard the term upload. And if you haven't heard the term upload, it means transfer and copying the brain's matter onto a computational system. Um, we say computational at this point in time because that's the technology we use. If we use a different technology, perhaps it would be different in that regard. But if we are able to copy our brain's functionality, our memories, that would be a darn good thing. Consider all the people who've lost their memory in car accidents or through disease, through a stroke, through old age. If we could back up our brains and our memory and then download it, that would be kind of cool. You go, oh, well, that's kind of silly, but don't you back up your computer every day? I mean, most of us do. Most of us do it automatically. And if you don't, you kind of look at something. You didn't back it up. You just have it on your desktop and on a USB and it's not backed up in the cloud anywhere. So cloud computing has really shifted. It's been paradigmatic how it shifted the way we think about backing things up. The cloud, the cloud is in us, it's up there, it's over. We can't even see the cloud. It's this enigma, the cloud. But we talk about the cloud like we just met it yesterday or had breakfast with it. So the cloud is this enigma, it's out there, it has all the data. And we pretty much trust the cloud because we have security because most of us know something about pen testing or penetration testing. We know a little bit about technology forensics and computer engineering or cybersecurity. We know enough to know that it's dangerous and that identity, identity theft could happen to any one of us at any time. And if you go to any of the conferences like the Department of Defense or Black Hat, if you've heard of that, uh, these conferences where the cybersecurity people go are incredible, amazing how smart these hackers are. They will hack into you, sitting right next to you, and then inviting you to have a glass of wine or have tea and coffee, and they know everything about you. So it's very interesting to see the modalities and the personas that hackers can take on. Now, I'm not dissing them. It's kind of fascinating at this point in time. But the issue is we are never 100% safe. So I asked, um, I've asked every semester my cybersecurity students, what can I do? What's the latest thing I can do to protect my identity, not only my finances, but my personal stuff, anything I wrote? He said, don't go online, unplug. Don't even use your cell phone. The moment you use your cell phone, the moment you go online, the moment you send out a message, you are vulnerable. Now consider that vulnerability because with that vulnerability, your finances, your life savings, and if you're my age, within my age group, which is 70 and above, then you are thinking about, that's my life savings. I need it for the next 10, hopefully 20 years. I can't have someone go in and take that. This is very serious stuff. And if you're someone who works in a discreet operation, you want your privacy, it's very serious stuff. Okay, so. If we're so vulnerable with our information and our computer devices, and we're out there, and then the cloud's out there, wherever the cloud is, and a lot of our stuff is up there, we don't know who's managing it. I don't think it's right next door to God. I'm not sure, but I don't think so. Our bodies are far, far, far more vulnerable than our security. In fact, anything can go on in your body at any moment. As example, and I've given this at, at a TED Talk, and I didn't want to, and I don't like talking about it, but I'm going to because I think it's important. So I was in Japan. I was happy at the height of my career. And um, I was out to dinner by some aficionados. I felt sick. People didn't speak English well enough. 
I walked down the hallway, I fell, next thing I know I'm in the ambulance. I had about 10 minutes to live, I was hemorrhaging to death. Okay, I survived. Somehow I survived, and I did, I survived it, but the point is I didn't know I was so sick. I was so sick, I got to a point where I fell down, went into a semi-coma, and had 10 minutes left to live. Anything can be going on at any time. So while we think we can see inside our bodies with x-rays or MRIs or fMRIs or CT scans, we still don't know what's in the works. Cell mutations are one of the biggest, the largest evolutionary processes we are undergoing right now. Over the past 100 years, we have more mutated cells in our bodies than ever before. Our cells are constantly mutating. Is this a good thing? I don't know. We know that mutations towards cancer and bad diseases is not a good thing, but maybe our cells are mutating to adapt to the environment for good things. Maybe we're learning how to adapt to bright lights and, and maybe some of the smells in the air and all the other things. So we're adapting and we're evolving. So let's make our environment, our ecology, safe and pleasant and aesthetic and as feng shui as possible so that we're healthy that our mind is healthy, our mind is our most precious asset. Okay, so biology, cellular, vulnerable. Digital, avatars, virtual beings, how wonderful, how great is that? Vulnerable, hackers can go into you. If you're in um, VR, if you're in a game, I have students who play games nonstop. One student said to me in class the other day, I didn't sleep last night so I couldn't turn in my assignment. I said, well, why didn't you turn it? I, was in, I couldn't sleep. Why couldn't you sleep? I was more concerned about the student. Because I was playing a game, if I quit the game, the other player would die. Now, I'm not a high-end gamer, but those of you who understand that, you get it, right? If you leave the game, someone else that you're playing with on your team, or you put, I don't know if it's opposition, but it will die. They will die. And then you have that guilt, you cause that death, because gaming for gamers is reality. There is even um, psychological issues with this at this point. You talk about gamblers who get addicted to gambling. Gamers, there's a psychological problem going on right now with gamers who game way too much. And there's something called esports. Have you all heard of esports? Whoa. I mean, if you took, I wish I had a picture to show you of esports. Esports, it's like the Olympics, it's like a, you know, the NFL football game. The stadium is packed with hundreds of thousands of people all playing games to win. A 16-year-old, correct me if I'm wrong, someone here who knows him, won, I think it was last year, um, $3 million. Games are really important to a lot of young people between ages of maybe eight and 60, <laughs> put it there. Um, gaming is a sport, it's also a, an environment. It's digital, it's where people live and people do take on the characteristics of the players that they're playing, the games. So it's a fascinating culture, but the issue I want to bring up is esports. To play esports, just like with the Olympics, a lot of the players, again, they, the demographics are more young than um, over uh, 40, um, are doping. It's become a very serious issue because they have to stay up all night and keep on playing, keep on playing, keep on playing. They don't want to quit. So what they need? Uppers. Very serious problem. So just because it's digital and virtual and AR, oh, how cool. There's still hackers and there's still other issues that deal with our psyche, our psychology, and not getting too caught into it. Because where's the real me? Is it here or is it there? Okay, machine, the transhuman. I'm going to bring this up now. Um, I designed this in 1996, that seems like eons ago, but I had this idea that what if we had different bodies? What if we could have bodies that live longer, uh, were uh, self-regenerating, uh, could clean up any diseases, uh, could upgrade and, and um, you know, change the texture of our skin? If any of you have had skin cancer, you know how horrible it is. Even basal cell carcinoma can come back as uh, squamous. Squamous will probably not go into melatonin, um, um, Melatonin, no, not melatonin, um, what's it called? Melanoma, Melanoma. thank you very much. Um, but it could. Skin cancer is on the rise, something to be very aware of. So what we need to think about is this vehicle that we're in and how to protect it. 
No matter how long you want to live, that's your choice. But be healthy and be aware of what's going on inside your body. Because your doctor's your doctor, and yeah, they're smart and they know their stuff, but you need to know your stuff. Oops, forward. Okay, so along with thinking about transhumanism, and here's my book, Transhuman, what, what is it? I wrote this because people kept on getting it wrong. How much time do I have? Okay, I wanna bring this up to set the record straight. This is a short book. I have a book this thick. It's an academic book published by Wiley Blackwell or John Wiley and Sons. Um, very thick book, 72 authors in it. I was a co-editor and co-author in it, and I picked the top people in the world in their fields. I didn't care what their belief system was. I wanted the top people in the world in robotics, in artificial intelligence, in nanotechnology, in machine learning, and genetic engineering, is there space exploration, encryption, blockchain, you name it. I, well, it just happened that I was very lucky. They all were part of the first transhumanist list on the internet in 1991. It was the first email list on the future. And we hung out and we chatted, we talked, we debated encryption and blockchain and nanotechnology and artificial intelligence and the singularity, even Werner Vinci, who created the phrase technologist singularity was on the list. Marvin Minsky, father of artificial intelligence was on the list. So we had this incredible brain trust of interesting minds and we debated the future, which would come first, AI or nano? Will we get to you know, Mars? What's gonna happen there? So it was a very interesting time. The main thing that we discussed is not what is transhumanism, it would or the, the philosophy had already been written by Max Moore in 1990, right before the, the, the uh, web came about. And that email list was, again, the first one on the web. It was pretty awful, but at least it was there. Um, it wasn't until the 1990s that, the mid-1990s, where I had to really deal with the press badly. Not in the 1980s. Transhuman was fine. No one worried about it. It was just, you know, no one even paid attention to it because the, the terminology we were using went above everyone's head, and that's probably a good thing. But oh, in the 1990s, we had a couple of journalists who thought they'd really make us look bad, make us look like we hated God, we hated our bodies, we didn't care about the rest of humanity, we're greedy, rich haves. Not so. Um, the, uh, the point is, that what we saw through these incredibly emerging, speculative, accelerating technologies and sciences was a new possibility for our next stages as humans. And so what is the most important thing we need as humans? More humanity. Every time I think about it, I could cry. For goodness sakes, people. We get afraid of the machine, we get afraid of transhumanism, we get afraid of robots and AI and automation and this and that. We should be more afraid of ourselves for not being more humane. When I'm asked, and I'm asked on a daily basis, not by a student or a journalist, someone reaching out to me, why is this, don't you just want to be, you know, have everyone live forever and utopia? I said, what the hell is utopia? To me, that's a silly fictional dream of some nonsense science fiction writer. Well, you just want to be perfect. For God's sake, perfection is a loser's game. The, once, the moment you hit perfection, there is no place to go. As humans, we want to keep on learning and growing. We want to be better people. When we think about the tragedies that are going on today in the world, has what religion, what political group, what philosophical view, what theory has dealt with it? I know Buckminster Fuller tried, the architect who you may know, have known him or may not, he created the World Game Plan. He tried with all of his heart and soul. 
Unfortunately, I met him, I was able to talk to him about it. Well, he's no longer with us, but at least he had that passion. There are so many people throughout history who've had this passion that what if we could be a more humane society? And I constantly asked about, well, transhumanism, you have the haves, you're going to the ones who are going to live longer, you're going to have all the technology, all the sciences. I go, no, that's not the point. You're missing it. So let me make this really clear. Transhumanism. Humanism, we know that that came out of the Enlightenment. Humanism was, you know, looking at humans, et cetera, outside of religion, um, non-secular belief system. Well, transhumanism doesn't really care about that. You can be Catholic, you can be Jewish, you can be Muslim, you can be Buddhist, it doesn't matter. The point is, are you paying attention to what you are as a human and the fact that we are evolving and technology is here and technology is affecting us? And therefore, head out of the sand, we are going to change and evolve. So it is about time we all wake up and pay attention to this and learn some of the strategies and thinking effectively. So these are the ones I've come up with. Morphological freedom. Morphological freedom would be, it's, a, it's a, like a negative political view. It means you have the right to alter your body, your physiology, somatic and cognitive, and you also have the right never to be coerced, to augment, to enhance, to upgrade. That's your choice. Okay. DNA outbreak. If you want to have synthetic biology or your genes tweaked because you carry a gene that could cause ALS or you're going to reproduce it to your children so they have trace sacs or sickle cell anemia, diseases that are horrific, you might want to have that gene removed so you don't transmit it. Prima posthuman, that's the future body design I did. I called it posthuman just because that was popular in postmodernism at the time. I think I was playing up to ap academics. I would change it, and I'd have changed it to substrate diverse being. Um, I don't know what a posthuman is. That's whatever we will become. I don't think it means we're going to become a different species. I think it's more of the postmodernist academic sensibility. Um, Proactionary principle, another very important kind of socio-political economic term. What we've had in the past, and stemming from Germany, because I was a member of the Green Party in the um, 1990s, I was elected in Los Angeles by a landslide um, for Los Angeles County, all down Malibu, Santa Monica, down to um, the southern portion of uh, Los Angeles County, on a platform of using technology wisely. Um, the bottom line there was the Green Party. I I'm an environmentalist, so I loved the Green Party until it got anti-technology. But what I learned is that the precautionary principle is the guiding post that we use when in decision making. Now, that's not fair. The um, precautionary principle means if there is an ounce of doubt that that new technology or that new science could have a backlash or something could go wrong, mm, stop, can't use it. Well, if we had done that, we wouldn't have airplanes in cars. We wouldn't have computers. We wouldn't have toothbrushes. We wouldn't have any toasters. Okay, so the proactionary principle looks at all sides of the issue. It says, let's not just look at this. Let's look at the dangers of the current technology, the current sciences, and how they're not advancing. So maybe the new one could offer possibilities, but the old, okay, maybe a little bit of caution there, but the old one is doing really bad. So it's to look at all sides of the issue, and I think that's very important. So this is a transhumanist perspective on looking at um, dealing with the issues and the stakes at hand. Substrate diverse agency, we can't rely just solely on our own biological brain um, and memory. We do need to um, write down notes, take notes, take them with us whether they're analog or digital. Um, so that's why I think it's really important that the field of um, computer science that's looking at um, our cognitive properties and how um, our neural nets work, how our brain synapses and dendrites function, what those electrical charges are, where they're stored in different portions of the brain, really an important science to be paying attention to um, for all of us. And one issue I'm very interested in today is um, 
exponential ethics crisis. I think we do have a crisis at hand, and I think that crisis is what we've seen in social media, the um, gossiping, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, how many of you watch Black Mirror? Or have ever watched Black Mirror? Okay, so the one on the social rating, pretty scary, people rating each other. You walk by someone, they'll rate you. Thumbs up, thumbs down, or one star, five stars. So everyone's being nice to each other when they walk by each other so they get good rating. Oh my, that's scary. But what's scary is to hear the stories about people who have been um, cyber stalked. If you've been cyber stalked, it's a pretty horrible thing. There's no way you can protect yourself because a stalker usually doesn't have money and a stalker has friends that are good hackers. And if you take that cyber stalker to call the police, they'll say, are, is it in the same no neighborhood? No, they're cyber, I don't know where they are. Well, if they're not here in this area, we can't arrest them. If you go to an attorney, the attorneys will say, do they have any money? I don't know, I don't think so. They wouldn't be stalking me if they did. Well, nothing you can do. So basically, cyber stalkers can keep on stalking, and I think that's very dangerous. The level of a meanness that um, is sent out is astonishing, and that it's accepted as okay, whether it's done by any politician or any person in society, it's not okay. And I think we have reached a point of crisis with it, because if you look at the statistics on the number of teenagers and university students that are suffering from depression or sad, it's astonishing. And it's not only that, it's full-grown adults as well. Um, I have um, let go of many, I have over five, I had over 5,000 friends on Facebook, now I don't. Because anyone who says something mean about someone, I don't care if it's a politician or someone else, I unfriend them. I do not want to hear them in my social media. Thank you very much. Okay, so where is it heading in my last minute? Our brain, again, is our most important tool. It's the best technology we have. To enhance it, to augment it, we're going to have to do anyway because we're going to age. Now, if we could slow down aging, maybe not so much, but as we're aging, the brain starts deteriorating. Not my conjecture, it's a matter of scientific fact. So we have to be very careful about that and consider our brains and consider what the transhuman is. And I'm gonna break that down for you. I broke down transhumanism, comes from humanism, but humanism was secular. Transhumanism doesn't give a bloody darn what your religion or spiritual belief is, that's yours. The point is, we wanna become a more humane humanity, we wanna use ethical technology, or let me rephrase that, ethical use of technology to help improve our human condition and evidence-based science. Not science like stem cell here, stem cell there, gene therapy here. Gene therapy is not proven. Stem cells, you go to a doctor, they say, let me inject some stem cells. And I'm gonna tell you, some of those stem cells are not pure stem cells, and they can even go to an area of your body you don't want them to go to. They can cause cancer and tumors. So you wanna be very careful about all these hyped up new um, anti-aging therapies. Um, another one is um, uh, thermos therapy, that kind of works. Um, DHA therapies, any type of these life extension anti-aging therapies, most of them are hearsay and conjecture. There are no stem cells in your toothpaste, okay? So if you buy toothpaste, it has stem cells inside, your teeth will be stronger and whiter. No, that, that is not true. Over-the-counter cosmetics, even if you go to Nordstrom's or whatever your top um, store is and you get Chanel or I don't know who else, <laughs> but some of the top most expensive facial creams will claim to have stem cells in them so your, your skin will grow younger and plumper and more collagen. Not so, okay? Vampire facelift, <clears throat> whose blood is that? You know, so there's so many different therapies and um, I've done a tremendous amount of research on it. 
largely because one of my brothers is a plastic surgeon and he created Botox for cosmetic surgery. So we have great discussions about the uses of Botox, which are good. Yes, it's a tranquilizer for horses, but it's still, it can stop some frowns. But the aim here with your outer look is to be healthy, to exercise. And I wrote a book on exercise and health and maintenance and whatnot, but I still will go back to the transhuman because you can forestall aging to a certain degree, but unless you work your mental muscle, you stay cognitively acute and with your humility and integrity, think about becoming more humane. I mean, just notice it on a daily basis with yourself and with others. Sometimes I'm shocked at my own inhumanity and I'm going, why did I do that? And I'll wake up in the middle of the night and toss and turn about it. And then I'll try to make up for it the next day. But it is something that's endemic to our brainstem, our reptilian brain, our fight or flight. Um, issues. So the transhuman rather than the cyborg, and I'll end on this. Remember, the cyborg was a term created from cybernetics. Norbert Weiner, great feedback and control. The cyborg coined by and defined by Manfred Klein and, and um, his colleague, Nathan Klein, to be an astronaut for space exploration, to have a better astronaut suit, because we were really into space exploration in the late 50s, 60s. Okay, the term cyborg used in science fiction is about the machine, animal, and mm, we'll become AI horrible things, and we'll, like the Terminator. Cyborg in academics has been ruled pretty much by the postmodernist agenda in philosophy, and a lot of great work done. Let me give credit there. However, Postmodernism cannot deal with what we have to deal with today. Postmodernism turned its head away from technology, away from AI, nanotechnology, genetic engineering, all bad stuff. They went along with that. We know today it's good stuff. We know we can't survive without artificial intelligence. We need it to sort the data that we don't have the processing power in our own brains to solve. So we need it. Even Craig Venturer, um, who sequenced the, the, the human genome, uses AI to sort out all the data. We have to have it. Necessary. We also need AI to help us solve some of the world's biggest problems, like getting food to people who need food, getting medicine to people who need medicine, getting clean water to people who need it. It's, it's outside. We just can't do it on our own. We need AI. Number two, nanotechnology. We really do need nanotechnology. We need nanomedicine to go into the body and clean up some of the the, the damage from the mutations, the unwanted mutations. We also need nanotechnology to help clean up the environmental mess. Nanomachines can go into the oceans and clean up the oil spills. That's good. Now the ozone layer is closing. Remember it grew a big hole in the sky, now it's closing. But even with environmental fluctuations, we need nanotechnology to help us. So it has its good sides, can have its bad sides, but let's work on the good sides. Let's turn it and make it work for good. And um, the last technology there is, okay, AI, nano, genetic engineering. Um, it's not something to be afraid of. We're not going to create designer babies. That's a bunch of hyperbole. The transhuman is looking at the human in transition and transformation, transforming what we've put up with, our limited lifespan, our fighting, our fight or flight attitude, and we want it to become a more wiser, educated, informed, critical thinking society. And it's nothing more than that. It's nothing to be scared about. So instead of cyborg, I think the term transhuman is far more academic, philosophical, and on point with the human and machine and where we can take it for the benefit of our species and uh, the continuity and sustainability of our species. Thank you.